this is the only type of medicine, the only type of healing that has ever existed since man has been on, on Earth. The American Medical Association was formed mostly in part, if you didn't follow our methods, you were excluded from the club. So it was only the club of the leeches and that kind of thing. Though those two foundations started to fund the 31 schools and they didn't allow anybody into the school unless you borrowed money from Carnegie and Rockefeller. I have a master's degree in physiology, biomechanics, and human nutrition. I've spent the past two decades competing in some of the most masochistic events on the planet, from seal fit Kokoro, Spartan Agoji, and the world's toughest mutter, to 13 Ironman triathlons, brutal bow hunts, adventure races, spearfishing, plant foraging, freediving, bodybuilding, and beyond. I combine this intense time in the trenches with a blend of ancestral wisdom and modern science, search the globe for the world's top experts in performance, fat loss, recovery, hormones, brain beauty and brawn to deliver you this podcast everything you need to know to live an adventurous joyful and fulfilling life my name is ben greenfield enjoy the ride Hey, before we jump into today's show, I want to tell you a couple of things. First of all, I, in my opinion, it takes my guests and I a little bit of time to warm up on this show, uh, which is on bioregulatory medicine. And, and we, we really kind of scratch the surface of what he goes into in his book. I mean, everything from cancer profiles to digital pulse wave analysis to what's called contact regulation thermography, uh, different forms of hormone analysis that I hadn't heard of before, uh, neuroscan, what's called anthroposophical medicine based off of the teachings of, of Dr. Rudolf Steiner. Uh, and, and, you know, I went through his whole book and I had so many protocols I wanted to ask him about. We got through, you know, like half a dozen of them, but I really want to encourage you, like after you hear today's show, if you like what you hear, definitely grab this guy's book. I will, I will put it in the show notes for you. Uh, and it's, uh, it, it's again, like you got, we, we kind of warm up in today's show, but I really think, uh, looking into bioregulatory medicine and educating yourself on this is pretty important. And as you may have heard, I'm actually bringing a bunch of people over to Switzerland this summer to spend two weeks doing all the protocols that are in this book, actually living at a health retreat where we get to do all the different types of therapies and almost like this detox that we don't get access to here in the States. It's designed to, to reboot your liver, reboot your digestive system, reboot your endocrine system. Uh, we'll be doing a lot of like hikes in the Swiss Alps in the sunshine. We'll be eating these amazing organic meals three times a day. We'll be served these wonderful meals. I'm taking my wife. Uh, my, my boys are going to be there. We'll be in the, in the Italian quarter of Switzerland. So we're, all, we're already like putting little Italian learning language stickers all over the house to start to learn our Italian. It's going to be one of the highlights of the year. And uh, you can get in. There's just a few rooms left, but you can get into this thing if you go to greensmoothiegirl.com com slash Ben Greenfield. Green Smoothie Girl is uh, Robin Openshaw. She's who I've kind of partnered with on putting this retreat on. It's in Switzerland. It's in uh, this summer, 2019, uh, late June, early July. Ben, or uh, uh, if I can talk, greensmoothiegirl.com slash Ben Greenfield. So check that out and uh, enjoy this show. Uh, this podcast, like all of my podcasts, is brought to you by Keon, my playground for all things health and wellness. It's a company I created to kind of scratch my own itch to find pure and efficacious shotgun formulations of supplements and functional foods. Every single product that I have there is research backed. It's real world tested by me and my team of, of reg tag to to. Regtag? I think I was trying to say ragtag. My ragtag team of trench testers there at Keon. We have an amazing team. We try all this stuff. We hike, we rock climb, we compete, we weight lift, and we try every single product for you. We figure out what gives you explosive diarrhea. Then we nix that stuff and give you the good stuff. So uh, we created this entire company. You get a 10% discount on anything at Keon. Very simple. You go to getkeon.com. That's get K i o n dot com and you use code b g f one zero that gives you ten percent off of anything at Keon at getkeon.com. My playground. Uh, this podcast 
is also brought to you by my buddy Drew Canoli's amazing green juice company. Uh, what they've managed to do is take a ton of different superfood ingredients, put them into one little canister that they ship to your house. One scoop of this stuff is like eating a whole salad without all the fiber and all the all the roughage and uh, all the time and the chopping and the the the, the blending. If you're going to do like a green smoothie, they do all the work for you. Not that there's not something mindful meditation-esque about going out to your garden, picking kale and chopping it with your Japanese blade and hovering over that kale as you gingerly put it into the smoothie piece by piece. But just in case that's not you, uh, the green juice from Organifi tastes amazing and skips all the time and the hassle. Just a bunch of super nutrients down your gullet. Tastes good too. Uh, you get 20% off of any of the fine, fine products from Organifi. Go to Organifi.com. That's Organifi with an I. Organifi.com slash Ben. And the code that you can use there is BenG20. That's BenG20. All right, let's go talk with Dr. Dixon Tom about uh, detoxing ourselves. If you like what you hear, you can also go and detox with me for two weeks in the Swiss Alps. Uh, go to uh, greensmoothiegirl.com slash Ben Greenfield to get in on all that, that goodness that we talk a little bit more about during today's show. As you probably know, I tend to get pretty pretty enamorated and enchanted and intrigued with uh, all these different forms of medicine that tends to tend to kind of kind of fly under the radar of, of allopathic medicine, perhaps uh, things that uh, we don't do a lot here in in America, for example, and also things that that uh, are, are more advanced techniques from diagnostics and treatments. And because of that, I'm always exploring these books on medicine. And I recently read this fantastic book called Bioregulatory Medicine. Bioregulatory Medicine. I'm going to let my guest on today's show define for you what exactly bioregulatory medicine is. But it went into all these things that, that really I haven't talked about a lot before on the show, like uh, biomodulation and bioresonance and electrodermal testing and neuro scanning and and also just the self healing and regenerative properties of the human body when it's placed into the into the right conditions uh, the right biological terrain so to speak which we'll explore on today's show now as we go you can access everything that we talk about from uh, the book bioregulatory medicine which was written by my guest today uh, over at bengreenfieldfitness.com slash biomedicine that's bengreenfieldfitness.com slash bio medicine so my guest on today's show is Dr. Dixon Tom, although I just learned when I was speaking with him before we started recording that if I want to sound like a sophisticated German, I would pronounce it Dr. Dixon Tom. Uh, his book is called Bioregulatory Medicine, an Innovative Holistic Approach to Self-Healing. Uh, Dr. Tom graduated from the University of uh, Toronto uh, Faculty of Dentistry in the 70s, and then he got his Doctor of Naturopathic Medicine from the Ontario College of Naturopathic Medicine in 1986. And in 1989, he got another naturopathic degree from National College of Naturopathic Medicine in Portland, Oregon. Uh, he was a full-time professor and the past dean of naturopathic medicine at that National College of Natural Medicine in Portland, where he taught things like gastroenterology and neurology and endocrinology, x-ray, uh, for over 25 years. And he's now the medical director at the American Center for Biological Medicine and the American Center for Alternative Medicine in Scottsdale, Arizona. And I'll link to his uh, his place down there in the show notes as well, but it's it's the biomedcenter.com is the website for his current practice down in Scottsdale. So uh, he is well-informed, as you can imagine, with that deep history in natural medicine. We're going to take a deep dive into some of his expertise today. So, Dr. Tome, welcome to the show, man. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Yes, sir. And uh, I'm I'm just curious. Uh, I, I didn't tell you I was going to ask you this question, but I'm going to launch it at you right now. I'm curious how a guy who is as steeped in, in natural medicine as you are uh, eats breakfast right before you come on and do a big podcast like this. Are you a, a fasting guy, a bacon and eggs, a, a green smoothie? What's your what's your uh, what's your weapon over there? 
so I, did, I went to the or doing the intermittent fasting, partially keto, uh, ketogenic, part paleo, uh, trying to keep moderate carbs, um, you know, more in the seed idea. So basically trying to eat uh, fast for 16, 18 hours a day and then eat, uh, you know, within a 12 to you know, six, seven in the, in the afternoon uh, type thing. It's, it's better from a biochemistry. It's better for buying, uh, balancing with metabolism. And, you know, as a physician for so many years and seeing so many patients with now more and more problems related to metabolic problems, uh, this seems to be one of the ways that we're uh, able to help people move uh, more into a, a place that we call homeodynamics or homeostasis, which is really what biological medicine is really all about, is how do we get people back to balance and allow their own body to be able to do its own level of healing. Yeah, yeah. So so uh, coming full circle, though, what what did you eat? What did I eat today? Yeah. <laughs> What I ate today is basically a protein, a couple of eggs, as you said, turkey bacon. Uh, I pretty much avo avoid carbs, so an avocado, like olive oil or coconut oil, coconut drink, coconut uh, uh, milk, and that kind of stuff uh, is a, sort of a typical typical morning. Eggs, turkey bacon, and avocado. That sounds pretty good. I could I could get on that bandwagon. <laughs> I like it. I'm, I'm glad you didn't say Captain Crunch, or we would have had to tune you out for the rest of this episode. Uh, no, that's not on. That's not on the menu. All right. Well, let's get into the topic at hand: bioregulatory medicine. I think a, a lot of people aren't going to be familiar with that term or exactly what it is. Uh, and, and you use terms like bioregulatory medicine, and even terms like biofield and and biological terrain in your book. So. Uh, you, you can take as deep a dive as you'd like, but I'd love to hear about what your definition of bioregulatory medicine exactly is and some of these terms like biofield and biological terrain. Uh, indeed. Um, and indeed, this may be a bit of a lengthy answer uh, because I'm going to sort of give a little bit of a horse, uh, hysterical perspective because uh, in reality, uh, this is the only type of medicine, the only type of healing that has ever existed since man has been on, on Earth. Uh, if we if we go back way into the history of medicine and we look at uh, Babylonia or we look at China or we look at Egypt uh, and India, we're talking thousands of years ago, you know, <clears throat> what they did. And we tend to think that the medicine was so rudimentary, they didn't really know anything. Uh, but, you know, using Chinese medicine as the example and the whole idea of how Chinese medicine has survived. And, you know, what is Chinese medicine? Chinese medicine, people think, oh, it's acupuncture or it's herbs and that type of thing. Uh, but what it really is, is it's, it's about balancing uh, energy flows. Um, the, if we look at then what the Greeks talked about and, you know, into the, into in the last 2000 years of how medicine has evolved, you know, we've got into this so-called scientific method and it, it wasn't until, which I'll talk about in a bit, the Flexton report, which is a hundred years ago, that medicine really meant a huge shift in the direction of, <clears throat> what is biological medicine, bioregulatory medicine? So the so-called new field of medicine or an emerging field of medicine is known as a biofield. A biofield is a word that basically is used to describe energies that the body is associated with. <clears throat> it is well known that for all intents and purposes, the body is one huge electromagnet. Uh, we have voltages, we have electrical charges. And, well, if I could, uh, if I could interrupt there, I don't know if that's generally accepted. I think, I think a lot of people uh, don't really understand, you know, the concepts that, for example, Dr. Robert Becker delves into in you know, the book, The Body Electric, that the body is an electromagnetic organism. So uh, you, you may want to clarify for some people who might not really be familiar with that idea. So the idea, the I think people can hopefully agree that, uh, you know, the body at least gives off energy. I mean, we always talk about how is your energy, are, are you fatigued or that type of thing. So we know that energy is being promoted and made somehow in the body to do all the things that we do. How can we basically move any muscles if we don't have, you know, some type of gasoline or some type of fuel in our muscles themselves? And it comes down to that it's really an electrical charge if we... You know, if we if we bend our arm, you know, what we're basically creating is electrons, and these electrons are creating like a battery that's that's running every piece of equipment that we now have in society. So this this idea that there's a field of energy that we have an electromagnetic energy associated with it, 
But now if you look back into the, what the Chinese have talked about, the Chinese have talked about these subtle energies. The Chinese call it qi, naturopathic medicine calls it a vis. Uh, so it's a subtle energy that maybe not be as uh, easy to uh, to measure, although uh, things like curling and photography uh, ha are able to pick up very subtle energies and measure that, that in fact there are energies that are associated with the body itself. Um, people may not be, uh, may be familiar or not familiar with the idea that some people have the ability to read these very subtle energies and are able to influence these energies. And these are the energies that uh, allow um, all our organ systems to function and to interact uh, with each other. Right, with, with perhaps the simplest example being ju just the either the electron transport chain in the mitochondria or the, the potassium sodium electrochemical gradient across the cell membrane. I mean, I think those are two simple examples people may have even seen in high school biology. I just don't think they think about it when they're when they're standing next to their Wi-Fi router or under fluorescent lights that, that electricity interacts with the human body and vice versa. Uh, very much so, and we now know, of course, with, with the <clears throat> exposure to Wi-Fi pretty much everywhere, we're constantly being exposed to cell towers, we're constantly being exposed to in our homes with routers and Wi-Fi. The effect that that type of uh, energy is having on us on a long-term basis, and uh, I typically think that Europe is sort of a way ahead of us. What the United States is ahead of us, you know. For example, they're I'll call them their their um, banning of cell phones for children, uh, knowing that the the cell phone radiation in a child that where their brain hasn't fully developed, if they hold it up to their ear, literally can be transported directly through their entire head. So in some countries in Europe, cell phones are basically not allowed for children until they're 18 years of age, until there's you know some more uh, maturation of that type of thing. So the idea of bioregulatory uses this concept that our body is really about energy. It's about physiology, it's about biochemistry, and it's about physics. And breaking it down to you know that aspect, if we look at physics, you can talk to, about Newton in the 1700s, who came up with Newton's law. And unfortunately, to this day, Conventional medicine still sort of believes that that's the model of how medicine, how the body heals, how we have to repair itself. But long before Newton came along, uh, you know, the Chinese said had come into this idea of energy. And then in 1927, uh, we had Einstein and Max Planck basically come out with their idea of quantum physics, uh, quantum mechanics, which and which ultimately led to the the. Uh, the discovery and the utilization of the atomic bomb and the realization that how much energy is gets packed into every cell so every cell in our body has an organelle in it that will make energy as you mentioned the electron transport chain and so if you have enough oxygen present within you know the mitochondria they have the ability to make these little packets of energy that we call ATP uh, up to something like 38 packs of energy when there's sufficient oxygen you don't have any oxygen they can only make two parts uh, of ATP and people say oh is that why I'm tired well maybe one of the reasons you're tired uh, generally speaking but it's still based on electrons as, as you mentioned the potassium sodium pump uh, is the way that uh, minerals move across cell membranes so there's there's a lot of aspects of that, that that we have to put into this picture so when we look at bioregulatory what are we really talking about uh, we're talking about the idea that there are multiple systems multiple organ systems within our body. And while we tend to think of them or that they may be individual, so you have a heart, you have a cardiovascular system, you have an endocrine system, you have a digestive system, you have a lymphatic system, uh, you have a nervous system. And unfortunately what's happened in medicine is that we have all these specialties and all the specialties don't really talk to all the other specialties. And so they would look at their own individual organ but you know when you when you're trying to grow a new heart cell let's say you you have you know something wrong in your digestive system and you go to the gastroenterologist and they say oh this is what we found this is the problem well you can't just have one specialist repair what's necessary if you if your house is blowing down in a in a hurricane you don't say well let's let's get some nails and we have a new house you have to have every single piece of the part in order to build a new house that's the same with the body in order to rebuild a digestive cell that may have been damaged or repaired or something, food poisoning or something, let's say, you can't just say, well, just eat the you know, food X. 
uh, <clears throat> which is why I'm sort of against uh, these so-called miracles that show up on the Internet saying, oh, take this if you have disease Y or disease X, or if you have cancer, this is the miracle. There is no miracle in the body. It's about balancing every single organ system. So the, the real focus of bio, uh, bioregulatory medicine is not to uh, look at people's symptoms. It's not to treat diseases. It's to try and understand which of the organ systems are, uh, are the most out of balance electrically uh, <clears throat> and what can we do to be able to facilitate uh, um, all those cells getting back into balance again. So we're not specialists. I'm not a specialist in anything. Uh, I feel I'm a specialist in health, but I'm not, certainly not a specialist mm -hmm. in disease. Because um, disease simply means something is out of balance. It's out of yeah. ease. Yeah. So our goal is to, how do we put it back in ease? Now, now you talk about the biofield when it comes to actually being able to to measure all of these elements of the human body that are, that are an interplay together. Can you define that a little more, more specifically, what the biofield is? And you even talked about like curly in photography, for example, which I think kind of gets a an eyebrow raised at it in in uh, modern medicine. But I'm I'm curious if that's how you would actually measure something like the biofield, or if some of this stuff is a little bit more quantifiable beyond uh, this this light photography. By definition, we could say that uh, the biofield is used to describe the field of energy uh, and information that basically surrounds us. You know, we, you know, our body has a confinement by our skin, but the reality is our energy isn't confined by our skin. Our energy uh, emanates, and when you're in the room of a lot of other people, or when you're in a relationship for a long time, you know, we, pe people start to say you start to look alike, talk alike, feel alike because you're transferring energy back and forth between the individuals without physically touching them. So the, the biofield is this information, uh, this energy information that surrounds us, both the electromagnetic energy and, as I said, this subtle energy. And the, the, the whole idea of uh, biofield is pertaining to us as living individuals is to then look at this, uh, these energy fields that extend beyond our body and how do we uh, how are we able to uh, to create a, a proper balance uh, for what's going on now curling photography is one of the ways it's been around for a period of time that that is, has allowed people and we have very sophisticated uh, imagery now you know if we go back to the microscope back in the 1700s when you know before they they were able to see something that's at a microscopic level they, they it was some abstract idea well, since, since the 1700s, when Van Luchenhoek invented the, the microscope, and then was has, you know, now we have these atomic microscopes, and you can literally see within cells, within organelles, et cetera, et cetera, of what's happening. So, curling photography or that type of imagery uh, is a way to be able to to measure those types of things, and we we are creating much more of an understanding uh, of why and how the body gets out of balance and the things that can interfere with that. And it'll still come down to if the body cannot create enough electrical energy through sodium potassium pumps and that type of thing, it's going to not be able to create enough energy. It's not going to be able to communicate with other cells uh, because there is an interaction between cells that, uh, you know, they literally are, we know that they can talk to each other. Now, those types of things with the scientific that way, the information we have can actually be measured now. How does Carlian photography actually work? It works from the aspect that, that it's literally picking up energy waves. You know, we look at the electromagnetic spectrum, and, you know, what the one that people are most familiar with, of course, is visible light, and we look at the rainbow. Uh, but we use electro, the electromagnetic spectrum on all levels from the idea of X-rays on one end and microwaves and, and uh, you know, pictures that, that we ultimately take, radio waves and those types of things. It's a, it's a, it's a different uh, frequency uh, that everything is associated with it. And through the technology that Carillion Photography has was developed, it's able to pick up these very subtle energies that can't be seen, can't be felt. Um, you know, going back to once again, Einstein is light a particle or is it an energy wave uh, type thing? You know, I 
can't explain it more than that because yeah. I'm not a physicist. Well, we know uh, we know that uh, that cells communicate using using photons of light. I mean, there there's a great deal of infrared communication that occurs between cells. That, that's that's uh, to, to my knowledge pretty pretty recent research that shows that form of cellular communication can occur. So it's it's likely that it, that uh, photography that is able to capture light photons is is potentially capturing that ability for cells to communicate. Yeah. Absolutely. It's and and I think as as time goes on, we become the the scientists be, and the physicists become much more sophisticated, and we'll be able to pick up much more energy. <clears throat> you know, the whole idea is is uh, are we going to be able to find you know the, the magic of of, of health and the magic of the human body? And I think we're a long way away from that because there's a lot of things that the universe uh, holds secret from us, and we'll continue to do so. That. So we have to do our best to understand what we do know. And we have moved a long way since uh, the Egyptians and the Greeks, but still have a long way to go. You talk in the book a, a lot about the, this idea that the human body is capable of, under the right circumstances, self-regeneration, or that, that has self-healing properties to it. What exactly does that mean? Like, what was an example of, of a self-healing or, or self-regenerative property that would be uh, kind of enhanced by, by a regulatory medicine? That's a great question. Um, and if, in fact, if it wasn't for the fact that the uh, every cell in our body has the ability to self-regenerate, to heal itself, you know, we would never be able to, uh, you know, we would basically be exposed to the first bug, first germ, first trauma, and we wouldn't be able to survive it. So I'm going to use uh, something that m- many of your listeners will already have experienced, which is a broken bone. So if I if you were to fall down and break your wrist... Uh, you know, you go to the doctor, the orthopedist, they basically put a cast on, they take an x-ray at three weeks, they take an x-ray at six weeks and say, your bone is healed. And say, so what does that suggest that the cast healed the bone? No, the cast didn't do anything. All the cast did was immobilize it. So the body, the intuitive aspects of nutrition, of oxygen, of blood, of of hormones and and everything else that's necessary for healing uh, basically was able to form a callus at where the break was, and then the, the bone was actually uh, healed in about six weeks. And we know that that bone is actually stronger now from where it healed than was, was that it was originally. <clears throat> What's also interesting when you think about self-healing is, you know, technically everything we know about nutrition, we could put in a Petri dish, we could put two, we could put a, two pieces of bone in that Petri dish, very approximate them so they don't move with all the nutrients, but yet it doesn't heal. So there's more to it. And this is what we call the subtle energy. This is the chi energy. This is the vis energy. This is the biofield energy that's necessary for the self-regulation to heal. You know, if you damage your, your macula in your eye, within two days, it's repaired itself. The cells of your digestive system are turning over about every three weeks. Uh, you know, he said that the bone is like six weeks. And so every cell in our body eventually regenerates and repairs itself. Our skin turns over, you know, every few weeks. It's like, that's what self-regeneration is. The liver is an interesting one. There's even mythology behind that. I forget the, the I think it's like the Greek mythology of the, the guy who gets his liver pecked out by an eagle every day and it regrows overnight. And that's actually been shown that, you know, that, that I think a good quarter of a, of a liver can regenerate back to its full size within like half a year. That is correct. In fact, uh, doing liver transplants, I mean, you can take a, you know, a, a young child who has some type of a genetic liver disease, who has a very tiny liver, but you can take an adult liver and you can just slice off a piece of that liver, put it in the, in the child and, and the, that liver will grow. Or if yeah. you, in an adult, if they had an adenoma of some type that you could resect that out. In fact, I've had several patients in this situation. They've resected part of the liver, and within six months, the liver is back to its normal size. It's the only yeah. organ, however, unfortunately, we have that will do that. If we cut our arm off, it doesn't regrow again. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's interesting because I mean, even, even nerves can regenerate, and that, that's a lot of times approach used, you know, in kind of a multimodal approach to Alzheimer's and dementia. Things like huperzine or apigenin or lion's mane mushroom they'll use to actually stimulate nerve regenerative effects and and heal up nerves. And and I believe that many of those are the same type of compounds that that are used in some of these more natural forms of medicine, like like naturopathic medicine or or bioregulatory medicine. But in, in light of all of this, you know, the fact that we know 
know that the human body works via an interplay of all these complex systems that we shouldn't treat just one system at a time. We know that the body operates based on, uh, in, in many cases, not just cell signaling, you know, as, as far as like uh, neurotransmitters and, and nerve synapses or, or exosomes, for example, but also be, via photons of light packets and, and even, uh, even, you know, protons themselves. Uh, I, I'm curious why don't more Western medical practitioners use this approach? And, and I know that you mentioned the Flexner report, which I believe has something to do with this, but I'm wondering if you can get into that. Like, like why isn't bioregulatory medicine something more people are aware of or practice? That's a great question. And, and I wish, you know, I'll talk about the Flexner report because of the whole aspect that it's, it's really the, the Flexner report, Let's sort of give a little bit of background on that. In in uh, 1857, the American medical I think May the fourth, 1857, the American Medical Association was formed. It was formed with the idea that there will be a club, there will be a physicians, like-minded physicians who practice in a specific way, who would have basically the idea of sharing information, etc. When you look back at the history of medicine in the 1800s. You look at the most common types of the, the recognized forms of medicine at that time was bloodletting, which is how basically George Washington died. Uh, it was the use of purgatives. It was the use of carminatives. It was the use of leeches, uh, bloodletting, all that kind of thing. Now, also at the time, coming from Europe, Europe, uh, uh, urine medical was the concepts of energy medicine, specifically uh, homeopathy. Uh, through Hahnemann, who in 1822 had published, uh, you know, one of his first books, The Organon, with the with the whole idea that we could use the the law of similars, like cures like that type of thing of using different types of medicine, and it became that uh, that style of medicine over the 30 and 40 years throughout throughout Europe, and was now coming to the United States. The patients who were going to see a homeopathic physician were having better success than the conventional medicine doctors who were using cathartics, uh, uh, purgatives, uh, leeches, etc. And because people doing those, such as Washington, died from the treatment as opposed to the homeopathic, which were much more gentle and were actually allowing people to get better. So the, in 1857, the American Medical Association was formed mostly in part if you didn't follow our methods, if you did homeopathy, for example, if you did eclectic herbal medicine, for example, you were excluded from the club. So it was only the club of, of the leeches and that kind of thing. And so, you know, and, and through, so the, in the, through the rest of the 1800s, <clears throat> there was these for-profit uh, medical schools they weren't, and with all honesty, they were many times were not properly trained. There, there, there was not, you know, good schooling and that type of thing. So it was commissioned uh, by the Carnegie in the eighteen, uh, the early nineteen hundreds, excuse me, and then in nineteen ten, uh, <clears throat> Carnegie, who was not a physician and he was not a medical educator, he was not a scientist, he was a bachelor of arts person. He was hired by the Carnegie Foundation. Uh, to look at the 155 schools that were medical schools that were in Canada and the United States at that time. And he visited all 155 schools in something like 163 days. So he was a busy man. And then at the end of that, he published a report. <clears throat> and that report basically is laid the foundation almost to this day of how medicine was being taught, how medicine was being practiced. And that, that was the Flexner report? That's the Flexner report. Okay, so what did he report? There were some very positive things that he reported. He reported that uh, there wasn't enough education uh, for people. They needed a minimum of high school education, and they needed to be standardization of what they were being taught, et cetera, et cetera. So he, he suggested that they reduce 155 schools to 31 schools. He said that we needed to have some type of prerequisites to know a little bit about you needed a high school diploma, you needed to study anatomy, and then study physiology, et cetera, et cetera. And so there were some good things that, that came for that, and that is still taught. In fact, it's taught in every medical type of an institution nowadays. However, on the other side of the coin was what he also reported uh, then some of these very unfortunate things, and, and not to offend any of our listeners, but one of the things he reported is he felt that blacks were inferior. And he basically said all schools teaching blacks medicine should be closed. 
the the idea was that there was the germ theory at the time and that blacks living in sort of their inner community had certain diseases and they would carry those diseases into upper white class white uh, who were the people that they basically wanted in the medical schools uh, he also uh, because they were uh, because medicine had continued to face a competition from osteopathic medicine at that time uh, the, the eclectic medicine, naturopathic medicine, homeopathic medicine, electrotherapies, etc. He basically said, "Well, I don't believe in any of those." So he basically for uh, said, "You cannot, you can no longer teach those in any of the medical schools." So in some, in like 1900, there were more homeopathic doctors than there were conventional doctors. 1923, all the homeopathic schools had closed, and I believe there was two that were left, and by 1950, they were all closed. There have been a few that have been open since. So for all intents and purposes, in 1910, medicine totally changed, and it's still taught that way. And so so why do Western doctors, uh, first of all, they don't know about it. I would bet most don't know about the Flexner Report. They don't, they, so, and if you're not taught uh, the, the whole idea that energy medicine is, is the root of of all illness it's like because that's not what's taught in the school we're still following the newtonian idea that oh it's broken take it out put a new part in well that's not how the body's ever going to feel we just talked about the arm you can't just put the two pieces of the bone together and say well i have it heal there's an energy that's associated with that's the biofield energy that we talked about earlier so what you're what what, what you're saying to, to interrupt about the flexner report is that his report led to the shutting down of all these complementary and alternative oriented colleges and programs like homeopathic colleges or or some of these natural medical schools but what was left in terms of of approved medical education programs they're actually funded by philanthropic organizations like rockefeller foundation and the carnegie foundation uh, but those foundations also had a lot of money in the pockets of, of pharmaceutical companies. Well, it's interesting when you look at it is that, uh, in fact, th- th- those two foundations started to fund the 31 schools and they didn't allow anybody into the school unless you borrowed money from Carnegie and Rockefeller, which meant that when you graduated, you basically had to uh, basically you know pay them back. And guess what Carnegie and Rockefeller were into? We're into pharmaceuticals. So they were the mm-hmm. some of the first pharmaceutical companies. So this is what they were teaching. This is what they were promoting, and this is what's been promoted uh, since 1910. Wow, wow, it's crazy. So that's one of the reasons that a lot of a lot of docs don't learn this stuff is it's simply not part of the the medical education that tends to be funded in large part by the pharmaceutical industry, but began with this Flexner report shutting down some of the education on more of these kind of natural bioregulatory concepts. You know, that's absolutely true. And what's interesting, as I said, they, they, uh, he even wanted to close the schools of osteopathy. But now we know. So the Osteopathic Association at the time somehow did a, fought back. So now whether you have a DO behind your name or an MD behind your name, it's exactly the same. Because the osteopathic schools basically said, okay, we'll teach you exactly. We'll teach exactly. So what we do in the osteopathic schools is we'll do some uh, I'll say physical manipulation, which they're excellent at. And I mean, they learn some aspects of that, but it's still very conventional. It's still very the idea that it's pharmaceutical based. Uh, you know, it's this the same concepts that, that uh, is taught in basically every medical school, even though the osteopaths were by the Flexor report were supposed to be closed. Hey, I want to interrupt today's show to tell you about clothing sustainably made from recycled plastics. That's right. My podcast sponsor, Viore, which is actually the clothing you're going to see me in about 90% of the time these days if you catch me working out at the gym. They just launched these brand new shorts called Banks Shorts, and they are perfect for workouts. They're great for surfing, paddling, training, yoga. They have this really cool athletic fit with four-way stretch with a quick dry. They're very comfortable, just built in support. Uh, they're super simple to, to clean. They're super simple to work out in. Not that shorts in general aren't simple to work out in, but these ones move with your body. They look really good. That's what I like about Viore, though, is I can also wear these uh, pretty much anywhere I want to be mildly fashionable and not look like I just walked out of the gym, not look like a gym rot. 
Jim Rot, Jim Rat. Uh, anyways, though, Viore makes amazing athletic gear. They have a whole bunch of stuff aside from these new bank shorts, but check them out. Uh, you can get 25% off of any of the stuff from Viore, but it's spelled V U O R I. I'm one of those weird to spell and pronounce companies. But you go to VioriClothing.com, uh, V U O R I clothing.com you under the code ben 25 you get 25 percent off your purchase and i do recommend may i recommend to you as your short sommelier the viore banks shorts the ultimate in versatility uh speaking of clothing this podcast is also brought to you by birdwell beach britches you got your uh, your viore uh shorts for your for your workouts but these birdwell beach britches Oh my gosh, anytime you want to go to the beach or the pool, these are the shorts for you. Uh, you actually look great in them. You don't need the perfect summer body to look good in Birdwell Beach britches because they build their shorts with innovative cuts to suit every single body type and usage from casual adventurers to expert watermen. And what I like about them is they're impossible to break. They're impossible to break. If a seam or a stitch or a grommet breaks on these shorts, you just send it back to the factory. They fix it for you. They're actually built with this surf stretch, four-way stretch microfiber, and uh, they're fashioned uh, based on inspiration from sailboat sails, and they have this proprietary two-ply nylon fabric, the most durable fabric out there. You'd think that you'd look like you're wearing a sailboat sail, uh, but you're not. The, uh, these these things look really, really amazing. They fit perfectly. They make your body look good. They're called Birdwell Beach Britches. Lifetime guarantee. Free shipping for any order over $99. How do you like that? You go to birdwell.com and uh, you'll get 10% off plus the lifetime guarantee plus the free shipping over $99 if you use code BENG at checkout. That's BENG. Pick up your first pair of birdies and see why they've been an American icon since. 1961. It's a freaking long time. Now that we've established what, what bioregulatory medicine actually is, I want to get into some of the some of the brass tacks here, some of the actual ways in which it's practiced. And the, and the first thing I wanted to actually ask you about is diet, because the way that you describe diet in the book is a very seasonal approach. Uh, based on on the you know the master fuel sensor you know mTOR which tends to be for example uh, I, I believe more more active you know during during some of these summer months and then things change in the winter and times of calorie restriction but I'm curious if you can kind of get into the the science behind this seasonal eating approach and how that would actually work uh, with something like bioregulatory medicine. Uh, once again, the the best uh, you know when I when I sort of look at you know there's thousand and one diet there's a ten thousand and one diet books that, that have been promoted and that type of thing. So I always look back at you know what did what did our indigenous cultures eat and uh, what did they have what did they survive on. We can go back to Weston Price, uh, who basically was a dentist, Canadian dentist, who in the nineteen teens and twenties went to seven sort of areas of the world that at that time had not been sort of westernized. <clears throat> so he went into you know, the Eskimos and the Aborigines in Australia and, and, and places in the Alps that hadn't sort of been touched. And, and he looked at their diets and the diets of those people <clears throat> were always indigenous to the food, the plants, the animals, uh, fish or whatever was was local to that specific area. That's obviously what they had. They didn't have you know, high speed transportation to take something growing from Mexico and, and eat it in Spokane, Washington type thing or up in uh, uh, Juneau, Alaska. So and what he found was, is that there was a very common overlap to what these people ate. Uh, in addition to, and so we talk about the Eskimos, they said, what the heck did the Eskimos eat? They don't, they, you know, they, they, do we eat a plant-based diet? They said, what was, what was growing up at the North Pole? There wasn't, there's not. So they're eating walruses, they're eating polar bears. So they basically had a one, almost an entire meat diet that was high in omega fatty acids, and yet they didn't have any heart disease. Uh, then you go into somewhere where, where the Aborigines are, we're almost from the desert of Australia, and say, well, what are they growing? They're, they're once again they're eating local animals and local plants and so you know some of the herbology that has evolved through these generations the aborigines and the maoris in, New, in New, uh, New Zealand have been there for thousands of years before the white man ultimately appeared and introduced these types of diets if we look at what the Chinese the Chinese are very resourceful the Chinese continue to do anything that's local to the area including 
insects and scorpions and you know trees and all that kind of stuff so we look at what we do and what's how and so if we look at that and we look at the evolution of the human body we look at the evolution of our nervous system of our endocrine system of lymphatic systems etc you know what, what what supported that and so what supported that were based on different seasons if you were in europe you had different foods in the winter time uh, than in the summertime and if you were in S south africa you had more or less similar foods year round. So what, what the Chinese have found, because parts of China get incredibly cold, is that during the winter time, when we tend to hibernate, of course we put on a few pounds. We put on a few pounds because we're less active, but we also eat more nutrient foods. It's like a bear, uh, where basically we're sort of living off our body fat. And the body has evolved to be able to do that. If we're in colder climates, the body has to generate a lot more heat. So it's preferred that in, in the winter time or in the colder months, we eat uh, warmed up foods. Uh, in the summertime, where it's hotter and we don't need to generate as much heat, we can eat co uh, cooler foods, salads and, and raw vegetables and raw fruits, etc. And typically, you know, from in a bioregulatory aspect, we look at not only how a person's digestive system is, but where do you live? Where did you grow up? Where did your ancestors come from? What is your what are your what have your genetics actually allowed you uh, to be able to do and yes we have the ability to you know eat lots of raw foods but since we're in the winter time in this part of the of the world uh should not be eating uh very many cold foods and especially if you're going to eat a cold food uh you know whether it's a fruit or whatever eating something out of the refrigerator is not a good idea because in the refrigerator the food is going to be above trees now we say well what temperature how does the body digest this well, we have a normal body temperature. Our normal body temperature is 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. And people say, well, where did that come from? Like, like is that a made up number or who has, who has 98.6? Like, where did that number come from? Well, that number came from the fact that the enzymes in our body necessary to digest our food functions at about 98.3 plus or minus, uh, 98, excuse me, plus or minus 0.3. So 98.3 to 98.9. So if you eat a food at 40 degrees, put it in your body, the body says, what the heck's that? I guess I have to cook the food in my, di in my own digestive system. And people say, well, no wonder I get tired after I eat this food because I, it takes a lot of my energy. 40% of your blood is being sh uh, shunted into your digestive system for a couple of hours to digest this food. And, and it does not, contrary to popular belief, cause you to lose more fat when you do that because you've amped up your thermic effect of food. It's a, simply a, it's not a good weight loss strategy to, to chew on ice, for example. Uh, but, but what I like that you get into in the book is, is how we have this master fuel sensor, you know, mTOR, the mammalian target of rapamycin, and it facilitates anabolism, right, like protein synthesis and growth. And that actually is something that tends to be more active under the sunlight, you know, during the summer. And then during the winter, you have a different master fuel sensor, you know, AMP uh, activated protein kinase or AMPK, which is more of, of kind of the, the enzyme responsible for stimulating the, the recycling of cellular material. So it's almost like we were designed to build muscle. Uh, and, and even perhaps fat in the summer and then break it down in the winter as, as we cycle between mTOR activation and AMPK activation. That is the evolution that the body has had to to be able to survive. And, you know, and now we have the scientific knowledge and, you know, we've done the research to be able to show that. Of course, if you go back into your ancestors, you know, if we go back 200 years ago, it's like, why do you eat soups? Why do you eat broths in the wintertime and eat, you know, raw plants in the summertime? It's because of what you're talking about. And so the body had to adapt via these mechanisms the same way as, you know, why did, why do we have so-called LDL, which is a so-called bad cholesterol? You know, what did that evolve for? And, you know, why, why is it bad? It's like, why do we have LDL? We, LDL is the plug. He said, well, it's bad because it plugs up your arteries. But if you go back, you know, a thousand years and say, well, there was no hospitals, there was no doctors who were going to show sew you up. So if you were under stress and you were about to be, you know, bitten by a tiger or whatever and started bleeding, the only way you plugged the hole was to raise your LDL. So it's a natural evolution. Uh, just like, you know, uh, people, the blacks from Africa who migrated up to Europe, uh, you know, dark skin, where, so they had dark skin so they wouldn't, so they would be able to protect themselves from the sun. But once they moved to Europe, they didn't have that. So they hadn't, so they, there's an evolutionary aspect of the ApoE4, which has to do with Alzheimer's and, and heart disease and a whole bunch of other things. So 
the whole the fact of why we have what we do and why we've modified what we do. You know, we live in a society where we move around a lot. We can food moves around a lot, but we should still be looking for the most part for things that are the most indigenous to our to our what our backgrounds are. And indigenous to the areas from from what we're eating, and you just described the two areas exactly. We add fat in the summer, so we can burn it off, and that's what a bear does when it goes to sleep all winter. I have a, I have three books that I think are fantastic for people who really want to take a deep dive into both eating according to our ancestry and seasonal eating. Uh, one is called One Hundred Million Years of Food by uh, Stephen Lee. One's called The Jungle Effect by Dr. Daphne Miller, and then one's called uh, Return to an Ancestral Diet by Dr. Michael Smith. I like all three of those books to really wrap your head around not only how to eat like your ancestors, but also how to eat eat uh, seasonally. So I'll, I'll put a link to those books if you go to bengreenfieldfitness.com slash biomedicine because it, that, that's intriguing stuff. We could talk for hours about it, or, uh, or you could go check out those books. Uh, and, and I want to I talk uh, now about some of, the, some of the things that you use in – your practice or some some of the things that a bioregulatory medical practitioner would use. And I realize, you know, again, we could talk for a very long time about each of these, but I'd just love to hear kind of a, a basic overview of some of the things in the book that I found most intriguing. So the first was a compound that I don't see talked about a lot, but that, that you harp on in the book, and that would be mistletoe. Uh, why is it that mistletoe would be a component of, of bioregulatory medicine? Mistletoe is an interesting uh, compound uh, that's obviously been around for, you know, for, for Forever, <clears throat> and you now if, if we look back uh, historically, and I always look—I always like to look back historically at where from, and you know, why are they still in our culture, and what, what does it come to mean? And I think, what you know, most people' idea of mistletoe is is you hang the mistletoe at Christmas time and you kiss under the mistletoe. It's like, so is that a legend? Is there, you know, what did that <clears throat> ultimately come from? So mistletoe itself uh, basically is one of the four plants uh, traditionally that were adopted by uh, Christians to celebrate Christmas. And so the, the idea of the evergreen leaves were to symbolize life uh, that, does, that does not die. So it's sort of eternal life, uh, which is you know, sort of from a spiritual or religious aspects. <clears throat> and then the Druids, you know, back in the Middle Ages, you know, they venerated the oak as if they believed it had magical powers against evil. So it started off somewhat mystical, we'll say. Certainly in religious ceremonies, they, there was this belief that the, the leaves uh, did symbolize life. Uh, there, there did become, supposedly, I think from Greek mythology again, this whole idea that kissing under the mistletoe is a but you know, person was shot with an arrow and then her mother kissed her and da-da-da, you know, all that kind of stuff. So what do we what do we typically and what has it typically been used for and it's it's basically used routinely uh, throughout Europe in virtually any cancer clinic you go to in Europe you'll find that mistletoe is one of the therapies along with every other treatment uh, that they typically do. When you say it's a therapy, how how is it used? Like in a supplement form, or is it an injection, or, or some other delivery? All deliveries. It's used. It's used as a supplement. It can be used as an herbal form. It can be used as an injectable form. It can be done IV. It can be done IM. It can be inhaled. So it's put in various forms, uh, basically depending on the, what where we're attempting to to use it. So we get extracts from it, and as I said you can you know we have available to us the uh, mistletoe uh, herbal formulas in Europe. You would basically find it in injectable forms. Um, the FDA is not as keen on it being, or maybe I don't know if it's the FDA, but you know, the, maybe the oncology aspects is, is not as open in the United States. But if you ended up in a clinic in Europe for cancer, I guarantee you would be exposed to the. Well, I'm I'm actually going to uh, to um, uh, Parachelsis Clinic in Switzerland. I'm I'm leading a retreat over at Parachelsis Clinic in Switzerland this summer. And I think, you know, they, they do, they actually use a lot of the protocols that you talk about in the book, like, you know, uh, colonic hydrotherapy and, and hyperthermia and ozone, but I believe they do some kind of mistletoe therapy as well. Uh, and, and if I'm not mistaken, is it a lot of times used for, for autoimmune type of issues? Mistletoe is, uh, can be used as many herbs. You know, I, I tend to feel that, you know, we, we tend to try and compartmentalize things and, um, you know, a lot of, uh, pharmaceutical medicine is we take extracts of plants, you know, bio, bioregulatory medicine, instead of using the extract, why don't we use the whole plant? Because there's some, everything, you know, what's, what's the great thing about uh, nature 
is when nature has a poison plant, right beside it, it has the antidote. And so if an animal happens to eat a poison plant, guess what? It's going to eat the, the plant right beside it also, which will basically antidote the poison. So the, the idea that, that we can use an herb, uh, you know, for a single extract is that it, it's basically it's about regulation. It's about creating eternal life, which sort of comes from the, the spiritual or the, you know, the, the mystical aspect of this, of what it's doing. So as a use for autoimmune, we say, well, what's an autoimmune disease? And autoimmune disease, people think, oh, it's a hyperreaction. You know, we have over 80, 85 autoimmune diseases that have been identified in our body. And people think, oh, you hyperreactive immune system. The reality is autoimmune is, doesn't mean it's hyperreactive. It means it's out of balance. It's, it's the, the balancing between the different aspects of the immune system are not functioning efficiently and properly. So you can take natural herbs. You can take natural substances. And what are they attempting to do? They're not, they're not trying to suppress now, if you look at the standard treatment of autoimmunity, it's like uh, using prednisone or a medication that basically stops a, a reaction. We don't try and stop anything. We try and support it. We try to, um, you know, make it more imbalanced. Just like, you know, from a bioregulatory perspective, if somebody has a fever, our goal isn't to say, oh, take a, an Advil or a Tylenol to lower your fever because that's going anti. So the whole, the word allopathic uh, means opposite medicine. So we're not doing the opposite medicine. We're doing the supportive medicine. So if somebody has a fever, what, what, you know, what I would suggest that they do is they, to their level of comfort, uh, they should maintain the fever. So, you know, if you're comfortable at 102, uncomfortable meaning you're, you're thinking that it's going to be a problem, especially with children, people are always concerned. They're thinking, oh, if they have a high fever, they potentially may have, you know, a febrile seizure. And it's true. Sometimes they do. It's more based on not what the temperature is. It's how fast the temperature rises. But what we would more support is, well, let's support because we know that, you know, what is the best antimicrobial thing we know in the world? It's called heat. That's why we cook our food. You stick a, you know, mm -hmm. and if that's you also why people get a fever when they're sick. Totally, because it's the body's natural way to basically fight the microbe, the virus, the bacteria, whatever it is. You know, you can say if you're going to cook your turkey dinner, would you rather cook it at 100 degrees or put it in the oven at 450 degrees? So at 100 degrees, it'll cook, but it'll take you five days. You put it at 450 and it'll take you, you know, 15 hours. So we can basically allow the body to create the fever and you'll be done in 24 hours. Or, or basically you can try and, you know, keep suppressing the fever and be sick for seven days. So it's like. Yes you're, yes, you're not comfortable for a day, but man, you're, it's, a, it's the best way we can try to get our, our immune systems in balance. So whether it's mistletoe or the many other potential herbal or other supportive therapies that we have available to us, everything that we do, as I said, is not about the symptom. It's about understanding the organ system. It's about understanding the physics, the biochemistry, and the physiology. That's what we're really supporting because that's how the body gets out of balance. And if we support the physiology with our treatments, it's to, it's to put it back into that. It's not to stop the reaction. I always say to people who have a headache, uh, if you have a headache and you take a Tylenol, and so what happened to the headache? They said, well, it went away. I said, no. So does that mean the headache was due to a Tylenol deficiency if it went away? And, of course, no, you still have the headache. You just can't feel it. Yeah. Uh, you know. Yeah. It could be your blood sugar or blood pressure or neck or sleep or whatever else. That's really what we're trying to address in bioregulatory medicine. Yeah, and, and uh, with mistletoe, you know, in many cases, if people are interested in, you know, either the injectable form or an extract or some type of protocol for it or a few of the other bioregulatory medical tactics I want to ask you about, is there a, kind of a, a directory or a place to find a practitioner who's well-versed in these type of protocols? Is, is there such a thing as a bioregulatory? medical practitioner directory or something like that unfortunately not yet uh, but it's coming and in fact uh, what I've been working on for the last year is a, is a curriculum uh, to be able to teach physicians uh, who are interested in sort of expanding their their knowledge base into this type of an approach so uh, we're creating a curriculum uh, which will basically involve teaching practitioners, in fact, in, in fact teaching an entire clinic, entire office, the nurse, the MA, the support staff, of okay. how we can introduce uh, these types of therapies and then make them aware of them, available to their patients. There, yeah. is, there is a couple of uh, institutes, the Marion Institute in Marion, Massachusetts, 
the Bioregulatory Medicine Institute uh, that's in Louisville, Kentucky, uh, have sites and have a lot of information available. And the, those are probably the two most present uh, available yeah. uh, pieces of information that you could use. I know in the back of your book, you've got a list of a few different bioregulatory organizations and clinics as well. So right. uh, one, one, I think, was, was the marianninstitute.org and the, the Biological Medicine Network at that website. Correct. Okay. Correct. Yeah, yes. I'll, I'll link to that one and, and to, your, uh, to your clinic in the show notes for people. Uh, okay, let's talk about a few protocols here that I think would be very interesting to people that I hadn't heard of before until I read your book. Uh, contact Regulation Thermography, or CRT. What is that? CRT is, a, is the aspect of um, measuring 119 points on the body. Uh, basically, and, and what we know from Chinese medicine is that there are, I mean, we know that, you know, there are multiple points in acupuncture. There are 900,000 points on the body that they would basically stick acupuncture needles. And so what are they doing? They're finding energetic energy points on the body. <clears throat> so contact regulation thermography, CRT, uh, is, a, is a diagnostic tool where we basically are measuring 119 points, and those 119 points link to about 15 different organ systems. They link to over 20 different types of tissues. So we measure, so there is a, the, the preparatory aspect is you, you don't shower that morning, you don't brush your teeth, you don't wash your hair, you don't, you don't eat breakfast, you drink water, et cetera. So you come in basically just like you get out of bed type of thing. Uh, we do that 119 points. Then what we do is we stress the body. We put the body under some form of a stress. So what we use during the test is cold. So we, the person sits basically in their underwear, uh, basically their, sun, their skin all exposed for 10 or 15 minutes, which is a stress to the body. Then we go back and we remeasure the same 119 points. Then what we do is we graph the, the before, we graph the after. So we have the before points, we have the after points. Typically, when, the, when we stress these different points, what's, what should happen is that, that there should be a, a slight change in the temperature. Uh, we say about half a degree, more or less, uh, of, of all the different points we're measuring. So when we compare the points, we can say, well, if when you're not stressed, when things are pretty even, you know, this is what's happening. Now, as soon as we stress these points, we say, oh, your digestive system isn't working properly, or your nervous system isn't working properly, or your lymphatic system is really congested, or you're not getting good blood flow into your teeth, uh, <clears throat> or you have prostate congestion, or you have breast congestion, or you have chest congestion. And we're able to be able to pinpoint very accurately, in a quick and efficient way, uh, an aspect of, of seeing what truly happens when your body is perceived by stress. And stress can be anything. Stress can be a happy thing, it can be a sad thing, it can be going to work is stressful, it can be almost in a car accident, it can be hearing bad news, whatever. So, and, we, and of course, if you don't feel these things, people say, oh, I didn't know my, my digestive system wasn't very helpful when I'm under stress. You know, and the patients who have irritable bowel syndrome perhaps say, oh, gee, if I'm going to go out and do something, I'll have uh, you know, a, a loose bowel, per se. Okay, we diagnose that as irritable bowel. But most people are not aware that their digestive system is not in good place or they have congestion in one part or the other. So what it allows us to do is to focus uh, specific organ systems to start our therapies. You know, we have so many different systems. You can't treat them all at the same time. We have to sort of prioritize them. The, the CRT is then a method uh, that we can utilize to see. And then after a few months of therapies, we can repeat these, the same contact regulation thermography. Okay, so so when you're when you're doing it, is it uh, like a scan, or are you actually directly measuring some kind of thermometer, the temperature on different areas of the skin? You're actually measuring. We're using a probe, just like a pen, and we're literally touching specific points hmm. on the skin that are related, like from Chinese medicine, to the different internal organs of the body. That's okay. what we're measuring. So you yes. would take the same areas where a Chinese medical practitioner might put a needle for acupuncture, and you're instead just measuring the kind of the activity in those specific meridians to identify whether or not treatment is needed for specific areas. That's correct. And it's a little, and yes, that's true. And people may have be familiar with thermography, breast thermography, as opposed to mammography which isn't exactly the same thing because that's looking at heat being generated in the body. We're looking at heat that's on the surface that is being stressed by the cold. Uh, we're using that as a, as a marker to see whether or not how stress is affecting your different organs. 
Okay, got it. What about a Zyto scan? What's a Zyto scan? Z Y T O. A Zyto scan is another uh, energetic uh, treatment or another energetic reading. Uh, literally, it's based on this whole idea of biofield. You literally are putting your hand on a on a plate, we'll say, uh, and we're basically it's running. Uh, there's a uh, electrical program. It's a computer program that basically is running an electrical program. And it, what it's doing is it's reading the energy that's basically coming from your hand on the plate. And by going through a whole variety of, we can measure many different types of things. We can look at how f- how you're being affected by certain foods. We can look at how your organs are, are in balance or out of balance. Uh, we can look at whether or not there's specific microbes that particularly are more active in your body at that particular point in time. <coughs> So it's a, it's another energetic scan. Once again, totally based on the whole like, concept of biofield and bioenergetic, uh, and it gives us another clue as that we can combine with the CRT that tells us is there a specific area of the body that's that's out of balance that we need to be able to focus on. And just as an example, you know, right now we're on this sort of the we're this side of the Rockies. Uh, since many of our patients come from the other side of the Rockies, and since Lyme disease is such a common uh, factor, um, it's it's uncommon almost to not find one of the uh, Borrelia or Babesia, uh, t- Lyme or Lyme co-infections in somebody who lives east of the Rockies. In other words, it's pretty much in every state, but it doesn't mean everybody has Lyme disease. It just means at some point you've probably bitten by a tick. So like Zytoscan it, would be one of the ways you could use to analyze whether or not you have Lyme instead of uh, like a like a, a blot test. Uh, it's 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 in we, work, we I call it the soft the soft diagnosis. Now I use most importantly for diagnosing Lyme is what is the patient's presentation. Uh, we know that many people who have Lyme, you know, get the bullseye rash and that type of thing, but many people don't. They then they never even know that they were bitten. Now, the, the blot test and that type of thing, everybody will agree that there's no real great test, which is why the conventional model, Lyme is chronic Lyme is like, oh, the Lyme, chronic Lyme doesn't exist. It's like, well, it does exist, unfortunately, but, you know, that's medicine is what it is. But, but yes, the, the uh, Zyto scan is a, a, another way. So I'll say to them, oh, you know, th- it may not be active or the body, the immune system, which is constantly busy, is just keeping it in check, which thankfully it does because we're exposed to things constantly all the time, but we all don't get sick. Uh, And why not? It's because our organ systems, our immune system, lymphatic, et cetera, is able to keep the body in balance and, you know, things are are just fine. So there could be an indication. It could be a, a soft way of looking at whether or not Lyme potentially may be part of a person's problem. Okay, got it. And then one other form of, of scanning or, or quantification that you talk about, because there's like, I think over a dozen different methods you discuss in the in the book, and some of them I'd heard of, like heart rate variability testing and some more advanced forms of, of nutrient testing, uh, and even, you know, electrophysiological testing of, of the brain using like EEG and, and uh, electromagnetic source localization. You talk about a VEGA, V-E-G-A, which sounds like it's it could be a, 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 a supplement, but it's actually actually uh, some type of, of analysis. What exactly is VEGA? VEGA specifically Vega, is the name of a German company that was formed uh, in the early 1950s. Reinhard Voll, who was a German uh, scientist and a German physician, came up with this idea of um, electrodermal testing. He was one of the original ones who came up with the idea that we could measure on acupuncture points different electrical energies. Uh, the system was incredibly complex. In fact, if you weren't an acupuncturist, you wouldn't even know where to start testing points. Uh, but being having his knowledge. So one of his students was Helmut Schimmel. And Schimmel is a medical doctor uh, and a dentist. He said, this is way too complicated. We've got to figure out a, a, an easier way to do this. So he used the concept of electrodermal testing, which is basically measuring uh, electrical energies uh, on a specific point. But he said, what we can do is we can, we can put it almost into like an electrical circuit. And so what he used is he created energetic vials, homeopathic vials, if you like, of thousands of different substances. So if you wanted to see whether you were sensitive to let's say uh, gluten 
as opposed to doing a blood test. Mm -hmm. You could basically get a positive a standard measurement with, uh, and Vega was the machine that he went to, the company he went to, and said, this is what I want. I want your scientists to figure out how to make this machine, this electrical machine for me. So they did. So Vega being electrical thermal testing, so in, the, in this electrical box that has some electrical components in it, it's attached with a cord, with a, with a uh, probe, if you like. The patient holds on to that. The doctor basically is holding the person's hand and is touching specific points on the finger. And then into the circuit, so you measure it fine, then you put some type of a, a resistance, you put a poison, a drug, whatever, that you know the person can't tolerate. Then you put like gluten in. And if the, if the machine goes fine, that means your, your gluten is not a problem for you. But if you put it in and go gluten is interfering hmm. with your biofield energy and say gluten is a food that yes, you take it out. So whether you want to do that or test a pesticide or test an or how strong an organ is, or if you want to test whether you're going to react to a specific medication, or if you're going to find a specific medication is going to be helpful for your high blood pressure, we call that filtering, we can put two things in. So, it's the, hmm. uh, so Shinwell came up with this whole method using this machine, this company, uh, basically called Vega Testing. Uh, and so then now it's basically it's all enclosed within a box because it's all energetic. And you can, I mean, it takes a skilled practitioner to be able to read it, to be able to do the test, et cetera. But it's another way, we call it a soft diagnosis. And it's, it's actually quicker and easier and more immediate than a blood test or an X-ray or any other type of, uh, type of uh, imaging that we can do for somebody to gather information. I think a lot of people are probably wondering at this point if there's actual clinical research behind this, meaning have there been studies in which someone has been shown to have a gluten intolerance or celiac or something like that via a test like Vega, and then also in follow-up testing been shown to have uh, immunoglobulin responses to something like, uh, like, like wheat intake, for example. Once again, there ha there actually have, and a lot there. If somebody can read German. Virtually all these studies are in Germany, and the, the studies have been done way back in the seventies. I mean, many many years ago. Of all, in fact, it's, like I said earlier, you'll find mistletoe uh, in many of the European cancer clinics. You'll also find in Germany, since Vega is a Vega comp a German company, that there are the individual specialists. If you go into a cardiologist's office, you'll find a Vega machine, and the the, the cardiologist will specifically test things related to cardiology. The endocrinologist will use a Vega machine to test specific things related to endocrinology. So they're far advanced and they're far more open from the aspect that this type of measurements, not only have they been studied, but they've shown to be clinically highly effective and you get immediate results. It's painless. You can do it on a baby one day old. You can do it on somebody who's 95 years old. You can do it on somebody who's in a coma. So, I mean, it's compliance is, is really easy and really it's not painful. It's easy to do. It's quick, that type of thing. So, yes. Uh, there are some of those studies uh, have been published and are, are translated, I should say, into the English language and goes way, if you go way back in PubMed and those types of things, uh, if you look at EAV, VOL, studies according to VOL and that kind of thing. In fact, I mean, I don't have, <clears throat> have that available at this point, but there's quite a number of, of those types of research available that have been done for sure. Yeah, I know you discuss a few of the different studies in, in your books. You, you take a deeper dive into some of this stuff. By the way, I'm looking forward to doing a lot of these quantification procedures myself because I'll be, you know, not, not in the German section, but in the, uh, in the Italian quarter of Switzerland when I'm at that Paracelsus clinic. And I, I think they do a, a lot of these and I'll be there for a good two weeks. So I'm going to have a chance to, to explore a lot of this. And hopefully for those of you who are listening in, I'll, I'll get some, some good photos and things up on, up on Instagram for you to see how this stuff actually looks and, and what I find out about myself going through that. Uh, I want to talk to you about a few other therapies in addition to mistletoe, of course, a uh, tissue cell salts, tissue cell salts. I thought that was an interesting one. I hadn't heard of it before. What would be the, what would be the, the indication for the use of these tissue salts and what are they? Uh, tissue salts were um, discovered or I'll say formulated by German. Once again, all this stuff, well, most of this stuff is out of Germany or Russia, Italy, that type of thing. So tissue salts were uh, developed by uh, Dr. Schussler, who was a German physician, who found that uh, when we basically, I'll call it cremate or whatever, when we take the ash of the human body, what he did is he analyzed it. And he found that in the ash, of, and the, the, the humans, 
didn't matter what culture or anything you came from, there were the same 12 minerals in the ash. So he surmised that all our cells have these minerals in them that are sub, that are necessary for health. And then what he did as a as a as a doctor, he started to say, hmm, I wonder if somebody who has certain types of conditions would benefit from doing therapeutically some of these minerals. So he developed what he, he's called the Schussler cell salts or the tissue salts. And there are 12 different compounds uh, that are basically dilute compounds. It's like uh, uh, ferrum phos, which is basically iron phosphate, or calc fluor, which is calcium fluoride, <clears throat> and cali phos, which is potassium phosphate, so they're silicon. So there are 12 minerals. And how they're used therapeutically is that because these, these substances, which are diluted, uh, in other words, most of the time they're diluted uh, uh, three times. And when we say diluted, so we, we typically call it a 3X or a 6X, which is from a homeopathic description. It means you take one part of, this, of the mineral, let's say calc fluor, <clears throat> and you basically dilute it three times in a dilutant. Uh, and then you make, that becomes your raw material. So now it becomes a 3X calc fluor. You can also dilute it 12X, 6, uh, 6X, et cetera. So what Dr. Schussler found is if somebody uh, had a broken bone or had osteoporosis or had some type of a, you know, musculoskeletal problem as far as hard tissue is concerned, or they were healing from some type of an injury, he found that in addition to whatever other therapies were used, if he gave the tissue salts along with it, that the person would heal more quickly. So the tissue salts themselves don't physically have the minerals in them. So if you use calc fluor thinking, I'm going to use that for osteoporosis, you're also going to have to have a source of minerals. So you have to give some calcium and magnesium and zinc and the, the other 25, 75 minerals that are in bone itself uh, per se. And so it enhances if we have a person who has anemia, for example, uh, and they're taking iron and they say, well, how come my numbers aren't getting better? If you give them something like uh, ferrum phosphate, which is the tissue salt of iron, what you do is you facilitate easily the absorption of the iron, and so you do them in conjunction together, and you find that the iron is more more efficiently absorbed. And so there, these, of course, have been studied for the last 150 years um, because Schussler was in the 18 middle 1800s, <clears throat> and so they're used routinely among bioregulatory docs and by nature paths, etc because they do enhance uh, the healing of whatever it is we're trying to support. Is it is it uh, an oral delivery? These tissue salts? Yes, they're they're, they're literally tablets. Uh, they basically are that look like little white mints type thing. You know, they they're these little <laughs> pills uh, basically. Would that be different than uh, so? For example, I use a, a hypertonic solution made by Quicksilver Scientific called Quintron Minerals. Uh, would it be something similar to that? But, but that's a that's like a sea salty tasting liquid in, yeah. in a little pouch. That is actual minerals itself. What what is in this little tablet is not technically the mineral. What this does is that if you take the cell salt with the ionic salt, you would enhance the absorption of those ionic minerals. Hmm. hmm. Very interesting. I haven't heard of tissue salt therapy before. That's fascinating. Isn't there a form of, of therapy as well in European medicine in which salts or mineral solutions are injected? Um, well, we'd certainly do IV therapies, and those are actual minerals yeah. themselves. It, it's, it's not IV therapy. I, 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 was, I was with a group of physicians a few months ago, and someone was talking about uh, mineral therapy that's, that's done via some kind of injection. I thought you might know. Um, if I if I can find it, I'll I'll link to it in the show notes, or perhaps if people are listening in, they can they can pipe in if they know what I'm talking about. But yeah, it's some type of like like an actual injection of of minerals. Um, it's I I, I forget what it is, but I'll I'll hunt it down and put it in the show notes for people over at uh, BenGreenfieldFitness.com/slash biomedicine. Um, or, or maybe I'll think of it while, while you're replying to this, uh, one of the last questions that I have for you, and that would be, uh, the use of another form of therapy called, uh, what, what do you, what do you call it in the book? It's a, a neural therapy, N E U R A L therapy. What's neural therapy? Neural therapy is the, 
usually the injection of some type of a homeopathic remedy into specific areas of congestion, uh, trauma points. Uh, you know, people will have if they you know if they have trigger points in their neck or their back, they'll typically go to a massage therapist who basically or a rolfer or somebody who will basically use their thumb and sort of dig in there. What you're trying to do is you're trying to break up that congestion, uh, that the tight muscles, perhaps the muscle is spasmed that's very tense and so you maybe somebody has a headache as a result of that uh, or they can't turn they can't twist or they so what we do is we literally inject it's usually a combination of a of a local anesthetic a procaine commonly uh, or lidocaine and then we'll use a homeopathic remedy uh, maybe tramiel or spascopril or something like that 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 has homeopathically been known to be able to, to be able to break up that fibrous type tissue and so what it does as all these things are doing, uh, it, what it allows is better energy flow. As soon as you have better energy flow, you have better blood flow. When you have better blood flow, you have better oxygen flow. When you have better oxygen flow, you have decreased inflammation coming into the area, and you can bring all the other nutrients and things that we know about decreasing inflammation into the area. So, so neurotherapy is not just used in the neck or back; it can be used anyway. If you have, you know, somewhere your knee is sore, you your, men, your meniscus or you or t- have a torn uh, ligament somewhere, you know, you can use neurotherapy sort of, and it's just, it's literally, it's a sub-Q injection, meaning you just inject it under the skin, put it local uh, to the area of where the inflammation is. And unlike, you know, people may be familiar with having a steroid injection, steroid injections actually break down the tissue. When we're doing neural injections, we're not breaking the tissue down. What we're doing is we're supplying needed nutrition uh, and needed therapies energetic wise to basically be able to facilitate once again the healing and so neural therapies are the type of thing technically could be done almost every day because we're not going to destroy the tissue unlike a steroid they say oh, we can't do it every three or six months because you know you'll eventually d- just destroy your tissue yeah yeah i've, I've actually there, there's a, a wonderful clinic in pocatello idaho that i go to a couple times a year for high dose vitamin c injections uh, it's the clinic of Dr. Jason West, and I, I didn't realize it was called this, but he's actually done the neural therapy on me before because he did a series of procaine injections, almost like teeny tiny little bumblebee stings, like like fifty of them, into the abdomen as a sort of gut reboot. So that that's that's what that is. That's what that is. That is exactly okay. correct. Yes. Okay. I got you. Wow. I mean, we, we only really scratched the surface of, of these therapies that you delve into in your book. And I, I, this stuff's just so much fun to be able to discover these new therapies and and th- things things that are being done to, again, support the body's ability to be able to repair and regenerate. And also, you know, th- things that really uh, take into account this whole idea of treating the body holistically, you know, taking into account the entire biofield. And I realize a lot of people think this woo this 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 woo there'll be some allopathic medical practitioners who jump in in the comment section and tell me i'm an idiot and and tell you that that uh, you're a quack but (laughs) ultimately i know this stuff is helping a lot of people and this this book it's a quick read but it was fantastic i know you wrote it with four other co-authors in in medicine and uh, I, I really enjoyed it. So it's called Bioregulatory Medicine, for those of you listening in. And I'll, I'll link to it at bengreenfieldfitness.com slash biomedicine. And then also, uh, if you're interested in, in anything else that I talked about, like the Paracelsus Clinic that I'll be at in Switzerland, or some of these books on seasonal eating, uh, I'll even put some helpful links to Curly and Photography, et cetera. And if I can find that mineral injection I was referring to, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll link to that as well. Uh, you can find all of that at bengreenfieldfitness.com slash biomedicine, along with Dr. Tome's website, which is the biomedcenter.com down in, uh, down in Scottsdale. And I would imagine if, if somebody is in the Scottsdale area, want to travel there, you probably have a lot of these devices at your clinic, Dr. Tom. We do. We have them all. Cool. cool. Maybe I'll have to come in for a tour sometime and check it out. I, I, uh, I, I like to discover stuff like this. So, um, thanks for coming on the show, man. This is fascinating. It's my pleasure. Uh, anytime. Awesome. All right, well, folks, well, I'm uh, Ben Greenfield along with Dr. Dixon Tome signing out from bengreenfieldfitness.com slash biomedicine. Have an amazing week and go leave your comments, your questions, and any other thoughts you have in in the show notes if you want to uh, continue this conversation even more. 
Well, thanks for listening to today's show. You can grab all the show notes, the resources, pretty much everything that I mentioned over at bengreenfieldfitness.com, along with plenty of other goodies from me, including the highly helpful Ben Recommends page, which is a list of pretty much everything that I've ever recommended for hormones, sleep, digestion, fat loss, performance, and plenty more. Please also know that all the links, all the promo codes that I mentioned during this and every episode help to make this podcast happen and to generate income that enables me to keep bringing you this content every single week. So when you listen in, be sure to use the links in the show notes, use the promo codes that I generate because that helps to float this thing and keep it coming to you each and every week.